morning, First Pres. Thank you for joining us this morning and happy Mother's Day to all you moms out there. Kids, I hope that you are sitting down watching this with your parents, probably in your family room, and I hope that you are helping your mom to feel loved and special today. Today, I want to welcome you and I want to invite you to worship with me. We are going to do the song called Reason and it's one of my favorites. The reason it's one of my favorites is because it talks about God's love and how God's love is the reason that we're able to have hope, that we're able to have joy, and that we're able to have peace, even during really difficult circumstances. And I pray that you feel that and that you know that. So if you are able, and kids, I know that you are able, I would like you to stand up in your family room or wherever you are and join us while we worship together doing the song Reason. Seasons of winter And you'd give anything To feel the sun Always raging Always climbing Always second guessing the timing But God has a plan A purpose in this You are his child And don't you forget He put that hunger in your heart Everything, every hour, every minute, every second, he's always been in it. Don't let a shadow of a doubt take hold. Take hold, hold on to what you already know. You put that hunger in your heart. You put that fire in your soul. His love is the reason to keep on believing. When you feel like giving up. Started in you, yeah, he's gonna finish. You put that hunger in your heart. Well, thank you, Mrs. Chabukas, and welcome to worship at First Presbyterian Church all. This morning is uh, going to be a great morning of worship. We've designed the experience for people of all ages. So whoever you are, wherever you are, welcome to worship at First Pres. To call us to worship this morning, I'm going to read the first verses of Psalm 95. And what I want you to listen for this morning are the plural pronouns. So we'll go back to like fifth grade English plural pronouns. The psalmist is not just excited about worship. Uh, clearly he is. He's excited about an encounter with God. But the psalmist is excited that we do this together. 
And over and over he says, let us do this. This is our God we're going to. And I want you to know this morning that whether you're participating in worship, sitting by yourself, or whether you're gathered with uh, your family, that you are a part of a community of Christ that's going to come before the Lord in worship today. This is Psalm 95, beginning in verse 1. Come, come on, come on. Let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God. In his hand are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it. And his hands form the dry land. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his prayer, under his care. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you for this day. It is uh, wetter than we would like. It is colder than we would like. It is more pandemic-y than we would like. But you made this day, and we are here, and you are good, and you are with us. And so I pray that as we bring our worship to you, you would help us to pray prayers that are th that are authentic, that you would free us to sing your praises, and that we would experience your love and your faithfulness with us this day. So inhabit our praises as we do this together, Lord. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Your love is like radiant diamonds bursting in size we cannot contain. Your love will surely confine us like blazing wildfire.
bursting inside. Good morning, First Prez. We are so glad to be with you this morning. Welcome back to our living room. Um, we're going to continue singing together a song, This Is Amazing Grace. Failing love, that 
So I'm here with some of the plants that I'm going to put in my garden and I have a really special one to show you. This one over here is going to be a pumpkin plant, but not just any pumpkin plant. This is a giant pumpkin plant. And over here, you can see on the package how big the pumpkin gets. See, that's a little girl next to the pumpkin. That's how big it gets. And the seeds are really, really giant. I know here's a really big couple of ones over there. See how big they are compared to my hand? They're super big compared to the other seeds and the leaves of the pumpkin are big. The pumpkin can grow to be up to 500 pounds heavy. And I'm gonna plant it in uh, my front, the front of my house. And then when it's Halloween, the giant pumpkin will be there ready to be decorated or just admired by trick-or-treaters. So mm. growing gardens is lots of fun. I bet that you have grown some flowers or uh, gardens. <clears throat> you might plant some seeds this spring too. I wanna to tell you about a story that Jesus told about a seed. He told a story about a mustard seed. Now a mustard seed, unlike my pumpkin seed, is actually the tiniest seed that you can ever imagine. It's super, super tiny, like that tiny. And even though it's tiny, it grows into the biggest bush or the biggest really tree um, that you could think of and uh, all the birds can live in it. And so Jesus said that the kingdom of God was like a mustard seed. It starts out tiny, but it gets really, really big, just like the mustard seed starts out tiny and the tree is really big. So um, what is the kingdom of God? Well, if you think about a king or a queen in charge of their kingdom, everything that they want to happen in their kingdom happens. And in God's kingdom, it means that what he wants to happen happens. So the way people live and the rules and all the things about God's kingdom, uh, they happen just how he wants them to happen. The really cool thing about God's kingdom and the cool thing about the seed is it starts in us, in our own hearts. And it might start tiny in our hearts as we follow Jesus and do what he wants us to do. But the more we do that, the more we obey Jesus and listen to him and follow him, the bigger God's kingdom grows in our hearts. And we become from a little seed into a beautiful, beautiful tree. So when you are out there planting seeds or watching the flowers in your yard grow this spring, I want you to think about the mustard seed and the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God, what God wants to happen in our world and in your heart, starts out small and grows to be super big, just like my giant pumpkin. Well, maybe even bigger than that. So now we're gonna take uh, some time in our service to give and to do our offering. That's a really special time and it's an important time in um, building God's kingdom because as we give to the church, as we give to First Press, everything that we do at First Press is to enlarge and grow God's kingdom and to allow his will to be done on earth as we serve those in need, as we serve each other and as we serve our community. So you can give in lots of different ways. You can give by a check, you can give uh, online, and however you choose to give, thank you so much for your gift to First Prayers. So thank you kids for listening, thank you grown-ups for giving, and kids, don't forget that you too can be part of giving to the church. If you would like to give to the church, talk to your mom and dad and see if you can find another way for you to do that too. I love my mom because she is kind, awesome, and I, and she loves me so much. I'm thankful for my mom because she's always such a great role model for me. She always shows me how to be caring and strong. I love my mom because she's always there to help me and she does fun things with me. I love my mom because no matter how many times I ask her about something I'm unsure about, she answers it every time and is so caring about it, so I learn a lot from her. I love my mom because she colors with me, she does gymnastics with me, and she has my baby sister in her belly. Happy Mother's Day. I'm thankful for my mom because she supports me in everything I do, and she's always there to help me, and she does so much for me, and as I get older, every day I start to realize more and more how much she does for me, and I'm just so grateful to have her in my life. I love my mom because when I get hurt, she hugs me. 
for my mom because she's really helpful with everything I do in college. Sometimes she even takes like day trips down to see me just to get lunch, even though it's three hours away. So I'm really thankful for that and I love you, mom. I love my mom. She is nice and makes dinner for my family. She has warm hugs and she is a good helper and takes care of my family. Happy Mother's Day. I love you, mom. I love my mom because I think she's wonderful. She teaches me a lot of things. I love my mom because she's my biggest fan in everything I do. And I want her to know that even when I fail to acknowledge it, I'm so thankful for her unconditional and never ending support. I'm thankful for my mom because not only is she my mom, but she's a friend of mine. My mom makes me feel very happy because she's kind and loving. She makes dinner for me and my family almost every night and plays with me and my sister almost every day. My mom is very kind and loving, as you can see. I love you, happy Mother's Day. I love my mom because she does so many things for us. She cooks for us, she gets us things that we want and things that we need, and she loves us from the bottom of her heart, and that's really special. I'm thankful for my mom because she supports me no matter what, and she always encourages me to step outside my comfort zone. I love you, Mom. Happy Mother's Day. I'm thankful for my mom because she supports me and trusts me when I'm away at college. And when I come home, she is more than happy to pick me up at 2 in the morning from Midway Airport. And then when I am home from college, she makes sure that I'm always taken care of along with the rest of my siblings. I love my mom because she lets me bake something every single day. She takes care of me, my sisters, and my dog. She plays with me and my sisters outside and inside, or even on the trampoline. She cleans the house until it looks perfect. She supports me in everything I do. That's why I love my mom so much. Happy Mother's Day, I love you. When I think of my mom, I think of the ultimate planner, organizer, and list maker, whether it's a family vacation, a visit to a museum, or even a linen closet. She's always all in, especially if it involves family family dinner, celebrating holidays, but most importantly, what I love about my mom is her unconditional love for me and for her family. Love you, mom. This will be the first Mother's Day without my mom present. Uh, she passed away six weeks ago. She was almost 99 years old. I learned from mom the importance of studying the Bible and then watching mom, not only was it studying the scriptures, but it was also then living the way the scriptures called us to live. Mom showed me that Jesus was real by the way that she loved us. Jesus had to be a part of her life and had to be real because there was no way that she could have done the sacrificial things that she did, putting others first and, and herself second. So there's a, there's a great thankfulness for God um, having uh, given us this mother uh, that, that walked us through the, the joys and trials of life together. I'm thankful for my mom because she helps me at my worst and she helps me the same way I'm at my best. She's always loving and supportive and shows kindness to everyone. She's my best friend and my favorite person to be around and the best role model I could ask for. When I think of my mom, I think of her as the bright sun shining kindness down on us. This Mother's Day, I'm thankful for the love and support my mom always shows me, for the lessons and values she's taught me growing up, and for the wonderful role model she is in my life. On this Mother's Day, I have mixed feelings. It is the first Mother's Day that I am without my mom. She was, is a pillar in my life, and to not have her physically present is so difficult. My mom helped me know Jesus because she prayed for me every day that I would become a man of God. She led by example. She was a daily prayer warrior. The best things my mom taught me were to love with my whole heart, to be true to myself, and to love and follow Jesus. She left me a template to follow that I am forever grateful for. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Mom. I love you. I will see you there. What I want my mom to know is that I recognize how hard she works and she always does whatever she can to make others happy. What I want my mom to know is that we appreciate every little thing that she does for our family. Happy, Happy Mother's, Mother's Day. Day, we love, love you. you. We turn our attention now to God's Word for us. We'll be reading from Isaiah chapter 49. I'll be reading from the New International Version. You read from 
whatever version of the Bible you have at home. This is God's word for you, and it's God's word for me. Listen to me, you islands. Hear this, you distant nations. Before I was born, the Lord called me. From my mother's womb, he has spoken my name. He made my mouth like a sharpened sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me into a polished arrow and concealed me in his quiver. He said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will display my splendor. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing at all. Yet what is due me is in the Lord's hand. and My reward is with my God. And now the Lord says, he who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him and gather Israel to himself, for I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has been my strength. He says, it is too small a thing for you to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. This is what the Lord says, the Redeemer and Holy One of Israel, to him who was despised and abhorred by the nation, to the servant of rulers. Kings will see you and stand up. Princes will see and bow down. Because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, who has chosen you. This is what the Lord says, In the time of my favor I will answer you, and the day of salvation I will help you. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people, to restore the land and to reassign its desolate inheritances. To say to the captives, Come out, and to those in darkness, Be free. They will feed beside the roads and find pasture on every barren hill. They will neither hunger nor thirst, nor will a desert heat or the sun beat down on them. He who has compassion on them will guide them and will lead them beside springs of water. I will turn all my mountains into roads and my highways will be raised up. See, they will come from afar some from the north, some from the west, some from the region of Aswan. Shout for joy, you heavens. Rejoice, you earth. Burst into song, you mountains. For the Lord comforts his people and will have compassion on his afflicted ones. But Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will never forget you. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are ever before me. Let's pray together. Lord, we pray that today as we study your word that you would open our hearts and our minds and our ears. Lord, let the good news come now to us. Let it come with full conviction and not just with words. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. In the biblical book of Isaiah, a mysterious figure is prophesied about. A suffering servant who will bring the salvation of the Lord. And the New Testament authors repeatedly identify this servant of the Lord as Jesus of Nazareth. And in chapter 49 of Isaiah, from which we have just read, what we find really is a prophecy about three coming salvations from the Lord. One salvation is coming very soon. A second salvation is coming eventually. And one that is coming ultimately. Let's look at those three prophecies together. In verses 8 and 9, the prophet is speaking on behalf of the Lord to the nation of Israel, a nation that is at the time in exile. And we read there, this is what the Lord says. In the time of my favor, I will answer you. 
And in the day of salvation, I will help you. I will keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people to restore the land and reassign its desolate inheritance. To say to the captives, come out. And to those in darkness, be free. This is a prophecy about uh, the kind of salvation that will come to the Jews living in exile. The Lord promises to return them home, to restore the land that is currently desolate, and to free them from captivity in exile. And then there's a second salvation that's prophesied. It's a much more sweeping kind of salvation. We read it in verse 6. The Lord says, It's too small of a thing for you to be my servant to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles, that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. This, this second kind of salvation, a coming salvation, it's much more expansive than just delivering the Jews back home from exile. This salvation is for all the people of the earth. And the prophet says, not just people in Israel, but people in north and south and east and west. And he names some towns that are in the north and the south and in those directions. And it's his way of saying, this salvation is going to be for everyone. And the New Testament authors recognize that this sort of prophecy is about the salvation that Jesus of Nazareth brought as he died and was raised from the dead for the sins of the world. That's the second salvation that's prophesied about. And then there's a third kind of salvation described. The first one's very soon. The second one is coming. And the third is this ultimate, final, eternal salvation. We read about that in verse 13, where the prophecy is given, Shout for joy, you heavens. Rejoice, you earth. Burst into song, you mountains. For the Lord comforts his people and will have compassion on his afflicted ones. It's this image of the new heaven and the new earth, the salvation that's on the last day. It's a vision of the end of all suffering, the end of all affliction, all decay, all disease. Even death itself is put away. Three salvations in this prophecy. The Lord says, I'll deliver you, Israel, from your captivity and then through my chosen servant, I'll bring salvation to all the peoples of the earth. And then ultimately, the whole creation will be restored. And the response to this amazing prophecy in Isaiah 49 is skepticism. Skepticism. In verse 14, Zion, and, and remember Zion is a physical hill in the city of Jerusalem. And on that hill is where the temple was. But remember, the temple is in ruins at this point. The temple has been completely destroyed on Mount Zion. And the word Zion became a way of not just talking about the physical hill and not just talking about the temple, but Zion became a way of referencing all Israel. So what we have in verse 14 is Israel's response to God's promise of salvation. Zion says, really, that means God's people respond to this prophecy. In this way. But Zion said, The Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. This is a really interesting and skeptical response. God makes a panoramic promise of a coming of salvation, and Israel says, Yeah, you know what? I don't feel loved. I feel pain. I feel doubt. I feel forsaken. I feel like I'm in bondage, in exile. I feel like the temple is destroyed. Israel responds to the Lord by saying, God, this salvation may be coming ultimately, but I feel forgotten now. And listen to the Lord's response to this skepticism. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born. Though she may forget, I will not forget you. God gives to his people this metaphor. It's a theological metaphor, and it's not just cognitive. It's also emotional. 
It's designed to minister not just to their thinking, but also to their feeling. And the metaphor is that of the bond of a mother to her nursing infant. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast? Well, the answer is no, she can't. It's actually a physical impossibility that when a mother is nursing, she's going to forget the baby at her, her breast. I've actually worked with a number of women who were in a season of nursing, and on more than one occasion, a meeting needed to be moved by a half hour or so because mom physically needed to feed the child or to pump milk because it actually hurt to wait. It's physically impossible to forget the baby. To do so would be painful for the mother. But more than a physical impossibility, it's also an emotional impossibility. Because nursing a baby doesn't just produce more milk in the woman's body. Nursing also releases oxytocin, which is sometimes referred to as the love hormone or the cuddle hormone. Because it creates this feeling of connectedness with the baby. There's a chemical bonding between mother and child that takes place when the baby is at the mother's breast. There's no way emotionally for the mother to not have a connection or to have compassion for her nursing child. She's just awash in cuddle hormones. Today, some mothers probably are wishing that helping a child with e-learning would release oxytocin in their brains. But sadly, it does not. E-learning evidently releases stress hormones and anxiety hormones and makes heart rates and blood pressure go up. But nursing does the opposite. It releases oxytocin. And it bonds mother and child. The kind of love that a mother feels for her nursing child it's not just a product of the physical. It's not just a byproduct of the emotional connection. It's this unconditional kind of love. The most unconditional kind of love that we experience in the human realm. See, in most love relationships, there's give and take. In, in a marriage, in a family, there's mutual support, and there's give and take that happens. In the relationship between a mother and a nursing child, there's lots of give and take, the mother gives all, and the baby takes all. The baby takes, 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 takes. The infant does nothing to merit the love of the mother. And yet 24 hours a day, the mother's life just revolves around the infant. How sacrificial. How one-sided. How unconditional is a mother's love for his child for her child, and God says, I want you to compare that image to me, but my love is more. My, my love is not like the love of a mother that could be lost eventually, that could be weakened, or it could be flawed, that could fade over time. My love is unconditional. It will not be destroyed. My love for you is beyond the physical pain that a mother feels in her love for her child. It's beyond her emotional love. It's beyond even that kind of unconditional love a mother feels for her nursing child. I am more fixed on you than a mother is when the child is at her breast. Now you may say, oh, that's beautiful and that's poetic. Maybe a little bit insulting that God would compare me to an infant who can offer absolutely nothing, who can't care for himself, but it's a beautiful picture of love, but it's just words. How can I know that it's true? It's just words. I need action. I, I need action from God in order to believe that this is, God is a God of love. Israel says uh, they feel forsaken by God. And forsaken means this. It means you're not doing anything for me. I'm still in danger. I'm still in exile. I still need you to show up and deliver me, God. These are just words. So let's stick with the metaphor of a mother and a child. Children are often completely oblivious 
about all the things their parents have done for them, all the sacrifices they have made for them, all the love that they have put into action. As far as the child is concerned, the parents are there in order to meet their every need and desire. That's why God made adults, to meet my needs. And often it's the case that at some point a parent crosses the child. The child asks for something and the parent says no. No, you can't do that. You can't eat that. You can't have that. Or maybe they say, hey, I know you don't want to do this thing, but you have to do it. And in that moment, the child thinks, or maybe even says out loud, you don't love me. I want that. You're not giving me that. You don't love me. And at that moment, you want to say to the child, you little brat, you have no idea what you really need. You have no idea all the sacrifices I have made that are just invisible to you. And the most crucial sacrifices of love that I have made for you are not the things you're asking for now. And in the same way, the things that we come to the Lord with are often not the things we most need. And sometimes God's sacrifices are lost on us. Look at what God says in verse 16. The Lord says this in this prophecy, you see, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. And many years from when this prophecy was given, a man named Thomas, who doubted the truth of God's love for him, because the circumstances of his life made no sense to him, because Thomas needed more than words. This man named Thomas said, I don't believe it. You're talking about a God who loves me. You're talking about God's resurrection for me. I won't believe all this talk about the resurrection. Just like the person in verse 14 who said, I have been forsaken by God. Thomas doubted the truth of God's love for him. And then Jesus of Nazareth showed Thomas his hands. And Jesus said, Thomas, you want proof about my love for you? Look at the palms of my hands. Look at what I have done for you. This is not just talk. This is action. Even though a mother may forget the baby nursing at her breast. No, she won't. That's impossible. The Lord says, even though hypothetically that might be possible, as in completely implausible as that is, I will never forget you. Why? Because I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. You are mine, and I love you. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, for what you have done on our behalf, we give you thanks and praise. God, many are calling out to you right now. Many of us are asking you for things that are right in front of us that we desperately feel like we need. Lord, remind us of your compassion for us. Remind us that your grace is sufficient for us. Remind us that in Jesus Christ, you have given us all we truly ever will need. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for faithfully communicating the Word of God to us and bringing us comfort and challenge each week from that big room in your house. And thank you to Andrew and Hannah for leading us in singing today and each day. I hope that you have found that wherever or however you lift your voice in worship, singing out boldly alone, quietly in your heart or comfortably in the shower, you seek to make a joyful noise to the Lord our God. And to that God we sang earlier, this is amazing grace. And to that God we will sing the hymn Amazing Grace at the end of this prayer time. As we sing that much loved hymn, 
we will proclaim, "'Tis grace has brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home." And that is a statement of faith. As we sing that, we are saying that God has journeyed through my and our history to this point in life, through all the joys and struggles, and our God and his amazing grace will lead me, will lead us home into the most amazing presence of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. However long or short that journey may be, we are proclaiming we are in your care. We entrust ourselves to you, wonderful God. With that in mind, let us go now to that God who beckons us, and we will pray in a responsive style throughout. And so I invite you to pray along with Beverly on your screens. Let us pray. Our Lord, we know you to be a most gracious and present God. We are reminded in the writings of the prophet Isaiah that Chris shared earlier of the children of Israel when they were strangers in a strange land. Against their will, they were in a setting they did not want to be in, in the midst of exile. They cried out to you, their God, their beloved. You, O oh Lord, heard their cry of feeling forgotten. In that time, in the midst of their fear and sorrow, you compared yourself to a mother, a grieving mother, whose fierce love is unmatched. The exiled children of Israel, the chosen ones of the Most High, said, The Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? And you, O Lord, said, Though she may forget, I, the Lord your God, will not forget you. Lord, you then said, See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Father, give us the confidence this day and each day that we are yours, made in your image and considered as precious to you, engraved on the palms of your hands. This morning we ask that you, God, would pour out your blessings on our mothers and those who have given us motherly love along our journeys. We commit to your care all mothers, especially mothers on the fringes, like migrant mothers and those in refugee camps, seeking better lives for their children and their families during these deeply heavy times. Protect mothers and those who mother, who are taking care of their parents, children, and communities and may they come to lean upon you and trust in your strength. Bless with abundant love, provision, patience, and guidance every mother and mother figure as they shine their light in our lives. Our loving, sacrificial, caring Lord, we lift before you some who need your hand of grace and mercy today. We pray for your healing and protection upon Mary Hackman, and Pat Rose, as they need your strength and assurance this day. We lift them to you, Lord. We pray for Tanya Mitten as she has just begun new cancer treatment, and we pray for Phil Slocum and his family as he trusts in your care for him and prepares for surgery in June. Grant him your strength and peace in the days that lie ahead. We lift them to you, Lord. As we do each week, we pray for those in our midst and beyond who are on the front lines in hospitals and other settings, working hard to care for those most affected by this virus. We lift them to you, Lord. We pray for those who live with loss these days, loss of loved ones, loss of health, loss of employment, and so many other forms of loss, and for those grieving the loss of their mothers on this day. We lift them to you, Lord. We weep. And we lament for the actions come to light this week around the death of Ahmad Arbery in Georgia. There is grave injustice in this nation and world on so many levels, but particularly related to people of color. And so we confess yet again that we have so very far to go as the church, as people created in your image, to shine your light in the darkness of our nation 
and our own hearts. So while not all details of this case are yet known, we do not need to know all in order to weep with those who weep and mourn with those who mourn. Forgive us, Lord, and bring healing to our land. And we lift up our mission partner, Kids Alive, as they love and support their surrounding community in the Dominican Republic. And we pray too for our friends in Kemwegi, Uganda, and flooding that has thankfully not affected the school property, but has destroyed many homes and farms and some lives. May the school and partners in mission respond with generosity and wisdom. We lift them to you, Lord. We are concerned about so many things, things that concern you, things that you long for us to have a deep, caring, prayerful, active heart for. You invite us to rest in your amazing grace. But in our inadequacy, we lay ourselves at your feet, praying as Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our, our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, as we close, let's sing together Amazing Grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind. But now I see T'was grace that taught My heart to fear And grace my fears relieved How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed through many dangers toils and snares I have already His grace has brought me safe thus far, and grace will lead me home. The Lord has promised good to me. His word, my hope, secures. He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. When we Ten thousand years, bright shining as the sun. We've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first began.
say thank you to all those who made worship possible today, to all of you who participated in uh, creating video or leading us in music or in prayer, such a, a great team effort. Uh, worship is the work of the people, and you're a part of those people, and you're a part of that work. So thank you to you for joining us today and for being a part of this worship service. I know we long to be physically together. We're looking forward to that day, but when we gather, gather as the community of Christ for worship, we remember that we are together. We are the body of Christ together in this experience. And so thanks for being a part of that today. Now receive the benediction. May the grace and the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, may the abundant love of God, our Heavenly Father, may the presence, the power of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and always. And all God's people, wherever they are, said, Amen.